um, was published in JAMA in 2019 by Vanderweel and colleagues at, from the Harvard School of Public Health. And um, their flourishing index has uh, six key domains for reimagining health. And those um, domains were originally focused primarily on thinking about health for patients and populations. But we cannot adequately think about health for patients and populations unless we also think about those delivering health and health care within the overall system. And so I just want to invite you to think about uh, the components of that index as I go through my comments. So um, those six domains are happiness and life satisfaction, uh, physical and mental health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, social relationships, and then financial and material security. So with that index in mind, uh, let me move forward and um, share an overview of the three key areas that I intend to cover in my remarks today. The first is to provide an overview of gender equity in medical education um, writ large, followed by three case studies that come directly uh, from the clinical learning environment. And then um, finally, to conclude with frameworks, uh, and I will share two frameworks to support um, flourishing related to gender equity in medical education. So let me begin with this overview of gender equity in medical education. And I want to um, make two particular um, comments about uh, gender equity in medical education. And the first is that um, in thinking about what I might say to you today, um, I obviously had a lot of opportunity to think about um, my own career in medicine, which has been um, very uh, strongly and um, unbelievably aided through mentorship, uh, largely of men who helped me along the way. But on continued reflection, I'm also well aware that our profession of medicine has embraced science and technology in a way that has transformed health and healthcare in America. And I think about um, the kinds of discoveries related to the gene for cystic fibrosis or um, the ways in which the human genome has been um, decoded for us, or in fact, the ways in which immune therapy has um, led to unbelievable progress in treating our patients with cancer. And I could go on and on with those scientific advances that every day our patients and our, our um, systems and our population are benefiting from. So what is it about our profession that has allowed us to adapt and implement scientific advances at breakneck speed? but we've not been able to do the same thing related to human capital. And we've not been able to do the same thing related to our training programs. That's something I think about a lot and I hope I'm going to um, invite all of you to help me change the world around those things because we've known about these issues for a very, very long time as a profession, but yet we haven't seen the same kind of uptake that we have related to our scientific advances. And there must be some things that we could do differently to affect change. The second thing I wanna say is that the references that I'm using for today's talk really speak of gender as a binary. And I think um, all of us know that gender is not so simple. It's not a binary, um, but I am going to be referring to it largely as a binary because that's where largely the published literature um, has existed for a very, very long time but also because I did uh, spend so many years um, on this campus, I have uh, the personal relationships with students and faculty who have transitioned, and I don't want to um, unfairly misrepresent any particular individual in any of the comments that I might make. So I wanted to just offer a disclaimer about referring to gender equity as a binary without um, the explicit statement that it's obviously much more complicated than that. Um, so to get started, um, let me just uh, provide a, a broad overview of a few of the issues 
um, related to uh, gender in medical education. And this is not meant to be comprehensive, but um, they're the issues that I will focus my comments on today. So first is that we clearly have some disparities in professional opportunities. I'll share a snapshot about that. We have higher levels of mistreatment that uh, fall along gender lines. We also have an association with bias in grading, assessment, and content of narrative evaluations. And um, we have a clear impact on childbearing and child rearing um, that we've known about for a very long time and have made some, but very, very little progress uh, related to that. So what about the uh, disparities in professional opportunities? This um, really is a snapshot from the Association of American Medical Colleges database from 2023, showing on the left-hand uh, side of your screen, applicants to medical school by gender, men in blue bars and uh, women in the orange bars, and then um, matriculants by gender on the right side of your screen. And this just really gives us a snapshot of the last decade. And you can see that, um, we have achieved diversity by gender in our profession. However, the thing that's not obvious from this slide is that this diversity, in fact, was achieved on this campus in the mid 90s. And I remember um, being the internal medicine residency program director at that time when the Chicago Tribune and many different media um, outlets in Chicago were on this campus interviewing our students and then uh, Dean of Students, Norma Wagner, about the university University of Chicago achieving uh, for the very first time an equal number of women and men in our entering class in the Pritzker School of Medicine. Again, that was 1990s, not depicted on this um, slide. So the point is, as a profession, we have achieved diversity by gender in medical education, but we have not achieved equity um, with this wonderful diversity which we have um, attained. Um, I think you've seen this um, slide before in this series because um, one of the authors is our very own uh, Dr. Vinny Aurora. And this is a very important slide that shows um, the, the pay disparities. Um, uh, men represented here in uh, green, the women in gold, uh, the difference by the orange bar. And over the course of a career in medicine, um, all aggregated together, um, women are in general going to earn $2 million less um, than our male colleagues. And then of course this disparity is greater um, for the surgical professions, um, but nonetheless, it's a very large number. However, we um, cut this data. Um, we see disparities in promotion um, in the academic ranks. And this is a paper that was published uh, in the New England Journal in 2020. And um, what we see is that the disparity in promotion between men and women occurs um, both at the associate professor level and at the professor level. Um, and this is a, a really well done uh, and quite elegant paper controlling for a number of different variables. And the disparity um, persisted um, throughout the many different ways in which the authors um, analyze their data. So over a 35 year career, um, women were less likely to be promoted and um, there was no apparent narrowing in that gap over time. I don't know if you've seen this um, slide before, but uh, it's from the Association of American Medical Colleges um, database. And I think it makes a very powerful visual uh, point about uh, women at leadership levels in medicine and how that pipeline gets progressively uh, very narrow as we move from medical school applicants to those who graduate from medical school, those who become residents and then faculty, and then look what happens um, at the highest levels in terms of the percentage of women represented as division chiefs, uh, attain full professor status, attain uh, roles as senior associate deans, and um, very, very small numbers here for department chairs and uh, deans of medical schools. 
We also have gender disparities in publications, and there are a lot of different um, ways that this has been illuminated in the literature, but I chose pediatrics um, as um, the discipline to share with you today in large measure because it is a discipline that is heavily populated uh, by women as faculty members. And um, even in that field, you see, um, the first authors of various publications uh, by journal type on the left-hand side of your screen, um, men in the darker bars, women in the lighter bars, and on the right-hand side of your screen um, by article category. And so um, this was a um, surprising finding in some ways, um, but obviously a durable finding in terms of the number of journals and the types of articles that um, were analyzed by these authors. We also um, know that there are gender disparities in work that gets done in caring for patients and in doing the teaching um, to train the next generation that um, is not remunerated. And so um, one of those examples is narrative feedback to learners. Um, and um, what you see in this um, study by Mumtani and colleagues is that male faculty compared to women faculty were much more likely in the assessment forms that they filled out on their learners to provide nonspecific comments or no comments at all. And the reason that this is important is that um, accrediting agencies are looking specifically for narrative feedback. Um, that's one important thing, but students themselves and residents themselves are, are looking to improve their performance. And when there isn't narrative feedback, it makes it much more difficult to try to understand what the performance level is and how to help um, the student or resident uh, perform in a more effective way. Um, the Second example here is the workload um, undertaken by the electronic health uh, record and Rittenberg and colleagues, um, I think published a really incredible paper about um, women primary care providers spending 20% more time in the EHR in basket and 22% more time on notes than their male colleagues. But in large part, that's because they're receiving almost a quarter more messages from staff and uh, from patients when compared with their male colleagues. So no wonder they're spending more time in the electronic health record. They have a lot more activity um, coming into the inbox. And of course, um, they are not being compensated for that work. Now, um, I don't know if you've seen this um, paper before, um, but I wanna point out that this um, paper is, um, has the first author, a graduate of this medical school, um, uh, Teosi Adesi Oyi, um, who graduated in 2012. Um, and is um, in a surgery position at MD Anderson today. And she um, started an online community um, for physician mothers. And um, this online community was invited to um, share their experiences as mothers in medicine. And um, from that uh, survey, which she shared with uh, the group, um, a total of nearly 6,000 of the uh, respondents uh, reported um, discrimination, and um, those were fell into various categories, which you see um, on this slide. Specifically, my pay or benefits were not equal to my peers, um, and those who experienced uh, discrimination as mothers are in the um, lighter gray bar, those who did not experience discrimination in the white bar. I was not fairly considered for a promotion or senior management. I was treated with disrespect by nursing or other support staff, and obviously that has the highest um, rating uh, for discrimination. I was held to a higher standard of performance than my peers, and I was not included in administrative decision-making. So multiple different uh, snapshots for the ways in which the physician mothers were feeling discriminated against. Another part of that um, survey was um, a question, what are the three workplace changes that you consider most important? And these are the three things that group asked for. Um, a more flexible weekday schedule, a higher salary, and a longer paid maternity leave. 
Okay, let's turn um, to the second major um, category that I'd like to cover today, and that's case studies from the learning environment. And as I've already signaled, um, these cases are based on incidents which occurred um, while I was here at the University of Chicago. I have uh, changed some key details um, so that I'm uh, protecting the privacy of the individuals involved. Um, many of you have seen me use um, this framework um, but in prior presentations, and it's a framework that's actually fairly old, uh, written by Laurent Delos um, and colleagues, an educational psychologist, where he plots um, challenges on um, the scale from low to high against support levels from low to high. And you see in the lower left-hand quadrant that when challenge is low and support is low, stasis occurs for the adult learner. When challenge is high and support is low, retreat occurs for the adult learner. When challenge is low and support is really high, the learner generally has confirmation that what they're doing is, is just fine and, and appropriate. When challenge is high and support is high, that is where growth occurs. And that's where I hope we all aim to be working and living in that space of growth. But obviously things can go wrong and there are always things that we can do better. So it's in that spirit that I present um, these cases. So um, the first case is um, involves Jane Doe, um, a third year medical student on her surgery clerkship um, who was doing her a two week rotation um, in neurology. The attendings and residents were all men and the other uh, third year student rotating with her was also a man. In the outpatient clinic, she was routinely assigned only to the women patients because, quote, patients will be more comfortable. However, her colleague, medical student, received uh, patient assignments of both genders. In the operating room one day, uh, Jane was asked to place a Foley catheter. And as she was performing the procedure under supervision, the resident called out, hold it like you mean it. And then the those in the operating room that day erupted in laughter. So um, following this episode, um, Jane met with the surgery clerkship director to share that she was feeling as if she'd been denied some patient care opportunities during this urology experience. And um, she considered what had happened to her in the operating room that day, a really obviously uncomfortable and hostile kind of experience. So the question um, for all of us to think about is how should the clerkship director um, for surgery respond to this situation? I also want to say that I could have chosen um, an a very large number of cases where men uh, doing their obstetrics and gynecology rotation had similar kinds of thematic experiences. Okay, so um, for those of you who do not know, when students graduate from medical school all across the country, they are invited to complete a graduation questionnaire where they report on a whole range of experiences that they had in medical school. And then after the students graduate, the school receives in aggregated fashion feedback on um, the responses of their students. And they also get to see, they, the school gets to see the national benchmark related to each individual question. So among the questions on the annual graduation questionnaire, um, ask students um, whether or not they felt like they were denied opportunities for training based on their gender, had they been subjected to sexist remarks or names, and do they think they received lower evaluations or grades solely because of gender rather than performance? So we and other medical schools regularly have the opportunity to see um, our performance on those various questions. And what you see here um, is a paper by Hill and colleagues um, published in JAMA, um, where we see the, the national aggregates uh, by women and men, uh, women in the orange bars, men in the blue, on um, their reports of one episode of mistreatment, two or more episodes, public humiliation, subject to sexist remarks or names, lower evaluations, denied opportunities for training, 
and unwanted sexual advances. And in every one of these categories, obviously, women are reporting um, these events at much higher rates than their male colleagues. There's also a very important uh, component that is not displayed on that particular data set, and that's the component of intersectionality, where underrepresented uh, students who also happen to be from underrepresented in medicine groups um, had the highest levels of uh, racial and ethnic discrimination being reported. Um, Asian, underrepresented minority, multiracial, and LGBTQ students reported a higher level of mistreatment than male, white, heterosexual students. There is further work being done by this group at Yale on this um, topic, and um, the Macy Foundation actually is supporting um, this work in follow-up grants, so you will hear more to come. So let's go back to our, our students. So Jane Doe had this experience during her two week um, rotation on urology. So how should that clerkship director respond uh, given everything that I've shared? So a stasis response might be, well, I'll speak to um, the surgeons, uh, but you know, it was really just a bad joke. And why are you worried about your grade? The attending saw you place one Foley, it was fine. Nurses do it all the time. It's really not that complicated low support, low challenge. Um, retreating uh, from that state might be, you can't take a joke, lighten up. Remember, patients have the right to be comfortable. If you missed out, no big deal. Um, you weren't going into urology anyway. Some of these are actually kind of verbatim quotes, just, just so you know. <laughs> um, or, confirm how Jane might be feeling. Oh, so sorry that that was said. We've all been there. You'll get over it. Don't worry about the patients. I checked with the attending. He said, you're doing well. The more ideal response might be, I will speak with the program director and your attending. Your experience in the operating room was unacceptable. Um, I'll make sure that you have time in our sim lab to practice skills if you feel that you need more educational opportunities. So again, I'm not aiming for perfection here, just aiming to help all of us think of ways that we might be more effective and do better. So let's turn to the second, um, the second case. And this is a case of gender bias in assessment. Mary Smith is a second year emergency medicine resident. She aspires to become a chief resident. She knows that there are specific attributes associated with being chosen for leadership, including decisiveness and confidence. Recent evaluations have discordant narrative feedback around her autonomy and assertiveness and indicate that she's lagging behind in meeting her milestones. Mary actually compares notes with the other residents. We all know that happens all the time. It's one of the ways residents survive, you know, checking in with one another. And um, what she hears is that several other women are feeling similarly um, and reporting that they also are receiving conflicting feedback in their narrative evaluations. However, she's not hearing that from her colleagues who are men. So they decide that they're going to ask the program director, you know, is this real? Um, does the program director have a perspective about this? So what do we know? And once again, uh, part of what we know uh, came right from this institution. I actually remember when this uh, was presented at Medical Education Day uh, long ago, Vinnie Aurora is the senior author, and it was our own student um, who took a look at um, the feedback from attending physicians in terms of the milestone ratings that they were awarding to residents in emergency medicine. And um, what you see is uh, residents in the PGY one year, um, men and women, uh, basically earning milestone ratings at the same um, rate, essentially. Uh, there's a little bit of variation there. But by the PGY three year, there are uh, very significant differences. And those differences um, are such that 
uh, men are achieving their milestone rating. So if you get all the way to the right-hand side of that scale, uh, milestone level five, being able to practice without supervision, men are achieving those milestone ratings at a faster rate. And the aggregation of this data set shows that it adds up to about three or four months of um, training, indicating that men could finish three or four months earlier, or women have to extend their training three or four months. This is a really important paper and uh, very important findings. Um, there's another paper from the emergency medicine um, literature, which um, these authors looked at the narrative feedback in particular, and um, what you see displayed on this particular graphic um, is the times when the qualitative assessment of narrative feedback for men was in aggregate 5% or more greater um, than for women. And um, likewise, uh, when the commentary was 5% or more um, influencing the women's uh, uh, performance, um, you see it plotted here in the gold bars. And so the kinds of things that um, were favoring men are all those um, domains that you see listed on the left-hand side of that graph, professionalism, provider communication, differential diagnoses, critical thinking. The women were more commonly um, referred to in their narrative comments about their adaptability, their confidence level, their assertiveness with treatment, um, and more commonly rated below the performance of men. So I think there um, are a lot of very important observations by this qualitative data that should help us um, look very explicitly at our systems of assessment and do better. So what happened to Mary and her colleagues in emergency medicine? How should the program director respond when the women residents ask this question? The program director could say, well, we're using the forms that come from the American Board of Emergency Medicine and the ACGME, they're the milestones forms. So I'm sure everything's fair. Um, don't worry about the faculty feedback. This is the best program in the country and you're getting a great education. Um, the, the retreat might be, oh, don't be so sensitive. The faculty are doing important work and they don't need your criticism. <laughs> to confirm their experience, the program director could say, listen, the milestone ratings are meaningless. Don't pay such close attention to them. You're all doing great. Or, you know what? This is important feedback. We will look at our assessment data and if we discover bias, we will provide um, faculty development and come up with a fair and constructive way forward. I'm gonna have uh, the faculty ask you specifically what kind of feedback you'd like to receive um, so that they can pay attention to areas that you'd like to work on and develop further. We, we clearly know there is a lot of bias in our assessment systems. And so um, I think this is another example of where we can do much, much better as a profession. So let's turn to the third and final case, and that is um, maternity leave. So Molly Jones is in the first year of a cardi cardiovascular disease fellowship program, a field um, in which only 21% of fellows in America today are women. Um, and Molly thinks she'd like to be an interventional cardiologist. After many years of trying and rounds of in vitro fertilization, she becomes pregnant with her first child. During her pregnancy, she develops preterm labor and is assigned to bed rest for the last three months prior to delivery and a six week maternity leave. Her colleagues in the fellowship program are happy for her but resent the additional burden of work. They worry that even when she comes back, she, they will continue to carry a disproportionate load. Okay, this is unfortunately a really common kind of issue. And um, this is a paper from Stents and colleagues, which I think makes an important visual um, description of the ways in which our profession makes it really hard uh, for women who wish to be uh, mothers. Um, and you can see that depicted here 
um, by the age at which people in, on average graduate from medical school when they complete their training, their first attempt at conception, age at first pregnancy compared with the general population in the black um, bar, and then um, the infertility di diagnosis. And once again, um, Vinnie Aurora and colleagues published a very important uh, paper about what are some of the strategic ways that we could address um, these issues? Um, and one is fertility related education. Um, certainly wasn't talked about historically in this profession. It was a one-on-one -on -one, um, thing, but not a general conversation. Um, health insurance, big, big issue um, for all Americans and in particular for those uh, training um, in our profession and then overall support. So I also wanna share an anecdote. It's a really powerful one and one that has stayed with me for my entire career. And that is that um, for many years, I was a member of the American Board of Internal Medicine. And I sat on that board with one other woman, with one other woman at a time when um, we were presented with a proposal by the staff of the American Board of Internal Medicine to cancel um, maternity leave for all women. And on that particular day, I went beyond the wire arguing for why that was such a bad idea and why that would set our profession and our discipline back decades. As I said, there was one other woman in the room with me that day. Um, and unfortunately our argument lost and it lost on the premise that as you know, internal medicine and pediatrics offer combined training. At that time, in the early 2000s, internal medicine had a, a provision for maternity leave. Pediatrics did not have a provision for maternity leave. And isn't that ironic? Pediatrics didn't have a provision for maternity leave, but they didn't. And so those who led the ABIM at that time felt like we were um, diluting the American public by saying that everyone training in internal medicine had 36 months of training, when in fact, if you had a maternity leave, you would not technically meet that requirement. And so that day in that boardroom, maternity leave was canceled. So I could write a book about all the arguments I lost and that was one. And um, it obviously stuck with me for a very long time. But the thing I'm inviting all of us to mobilize around is why has it taken so long for us to change what is pretty straightforward kinds of, of things? Like how can you expect to be in, uh, in internal medicine in your late twenties and thirties or, or later and not have a provision for a maternity leave without extending your training? Well, um, the American Board of Medical Specialties, which is composed of all the specialty boards, internal medicine, pediatrics, obstetrics, and gynecology, radiology, you name it. If a certificate is awarded, they're a member of the American Board of Medical Specialties. And so what you see here is that um, that organization will now allow for a minimum of six weeks away, one time during training, for the purposes of parental caregiver or medical leave without exhausting um, your vacation or sick leave time and without requiring an extension of your 36 months of training in the case of internal medicine. Now, when do you think the ABMS made that rule? Yeah, yeah, July, 2021, amazing. Just amazing to me. So um, I think you know how I feel about that. Okay, so back to Molly Jones. This is a really um, challenging issue. And because of um, Molly being in her first year of fellowship, she wants to be an interventional cardiologist. Fellowships are really small programs, really small. So you have very little latitude as a program director. So how should the fellowship program director respond uh, and support Mary in this situation. You see here that I do not consider this situation one of low um, challenge. I think this is a high challenge situation. So we're not even gonna consider the quadrants of low challenge. So if we're going to accept that this is high challenge and with low support, the program director could say, are you sure you wanna be an interventional cardiologist? 
I don't see how you're going to be able to manage it. You'll be lucky to get through this fellowship at all. And that conversation has happened all across America in a whole variety of specialties for many decades. Or the program director might say, okay, we can help you get where you need to go. But for right now, let's um, put the timetable um, aside. I think you should consider asking for a formal leave of absence, focus on your health and the health of your baby, and we will stay in touch and reassess on a regular interval when you wish to return. Okay, priority number one, take care of the patient, take care of the resident, take care of the fellow in front of you. Now, this fellowship program director though also has all those other fellows in the program. So how does the fellowship program director support all those other fellows in a way that is as fair as possible? And I'm now going to step into Nirvana. Um, it's not a low challenge situation. Um, and I know that it's not necessarily going to work this way, but in high challenge and low support, the fellowship program director could simply say, well, you know, this is why there are so few women in cardiology. This, this is what needs to happen. I've made out a new schedule. You'll all be on every third night call for the rest of the year. That's not going to go over well, but it happens all the time. Um, a more um, healthy approach might be, I've gone to the department chair and I've asked for approval to hire an additional fellow outside the match. I will be also offering opportunities for other fellows and third year residents in medicine um, who might be interested in cardiology to take some of the on-call responsibilities. Now, again, we can talk more about whether Nirvana exists and I know and um, actually sat at, in the seats where that kind of a request would come through and often get denied, but that's, you know, Let's just say that this would be a more ideal situation and one that we should all be fighting to make happen. Okay, so I promised that I was going to um, share um, some frameworks and I do wanna um, uh, allow time for questions. So let me share those frameworks and then we'll get to some uh, conversation. So one framework is well known to um, those of you in the audience who focus on ethics. And that is, um, we should be using an ethical framework for training the next generation of physicians. If we were to do that, how would you assess how we're doing on these four domains of autonomy, respecting persons and their right to make choices, beneficence, obligation to contribute to a person's welfare, non-maleficence, obligation not to inflict harm, and justice, the distribution of resources in a fair and equitable manner. And I just invite you to reflect on, you know, the th three cases and the many cases that are well known to all of you and think about how well we might be doing or not as a profession. The other framework is the one that I introduced at the very beginning. So this framework, as I said, is, is um, meant to apply to individuals, our patients, to systems, and we cannot apply this to our patients and our systems if we don't also apply it to our healthcare professionals. And so how are we doing in those domains and what will it take to change? So I wanna conclude by talking about what will it take to change? and invite all of us to look at the image from the Agnew Clinic um, from long ago and compare that with an image of our own internal medicine residency program from the mid 1990s. We have clearly diversified this profession and I've shown you some of the data about that. But I've also shown you the data that demonstrates we have not achieved equity and we continue to propagate um, inequity um, from our assessment systems to the policies um, that we enact both locally and uh, nationally. So what is it going to um, take to achieve equity? One is to dismantle the training and career pathway expectations that are based on the traditional model. And that traditional model was um, invented more than 100 years ago, and we've made very little incremental change around that model. The second is to dismantle a culture of education that 
disproportionately mistreats women. And we've seen that data in our graduation questionnaires um, for many, many years. And yet we keep seeing the same kinds of data uh, reported in uh, the medical literature that I shared with you here today. We need to address and combat and correct this uh, physician pay gap. And I know you have work underway here that you've been at uh, work on now for many years. Um, we need to recognize and reward the work that's not compensated. And I gave you um, examples of that. And then um, very specifically, we need to provide on-site affordable child care and resources which promote healthy parenting. And I would have a lot more to say about that if time allowed. So I know most of those things take money. However, I believe there are strong and powerful quantitative arguments that could be made that then allow us to tee up choices about how we use our money. And I believe those arguments could be very persuasive by looking at the toll that the various biases and discriminatory practices um, take on women in medicine in particular. So what strategies are really needed to reach the tipping point where I'd like to believe we are, um, where we find ourselves? I would like to have thought we were at a tipping point back in the 90s when we achieved equity, diversity on this um, campus. And now you've seen, we've had um, at least a decade uh, really of, of diversity in um, medical schools, but our pipeline doesn't have that. So there are three agents of change according to Malcolm Gladwell uh, in his book, The Tipping Point, the law of the few. And that means taking the people who are the connectors, the managers and the producers to make real change. I believe you have all those people right here um, at the University of Chicago, and you are in positions uh, for a national platform to make real change. The stickiness factor, what can you do in the various tactics that you might take that will have the stickiness that will be durable over time and not just dependent upon who the department chair is, who the dean is, um, who is the person who has the decision-making authority, what are the stickiness policies that um, will allow this to really be a new world for the next generation of physicians? And then finally, the power of context. And that is um, to examine health and healthcare in America today, to examine um, those who are choosing to pursue careers in medicine and using that context as the engine to drive real change. Why do we wanna do that? So that together um, we can all flourish, our patients, our population, and importantly, um, the women who are choosing a career in medicine. I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Macy Foundation, um, who I have the pleasure of working with every day and a particular shout out and thank you to uh, Dana Levinson, who joined me at the Macy Foundation a little more than a year ago two years ago, and um, she's here in the audience uh, today. So uh, Dana, thank you. And um, I know that many of you will want to say hello to her. So um, I'm going to stop there. Um, Julie, and we'll be happy to take questions. Great. Dr. Levine, you want to ask the first question? Oh, that was so great. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about that slide we have where only about 18% of women achieve the incoming department chairs or deans. And it seems to be that nowadays there's more and more organizations that are selectively looking for women for these positions. So the word is out we're looking for women, yet women are still being held back or feeling that they're holding back themselves to go after those positions. What should the universities be doing to help? promote their own women to encourage them to look for these positions or think about achieving a higher level where they are. Yeah. Okay, that is a great question. Um, and I think it starts with who's in the pipeline. And I think you um, are in a very good position here on this campus, but nationally, we also know the beginning of that pipeline is in good shape. Search committees need to be uh, composed of a very diverse um, group and in particular must um, include women, not only as members of the committee, but um, when appropriate and often, I hope, um, as the chairs of those search committees. 
um, identifying the woman candidate as well as your pool of candidates, but in particular, setting up the interview day and the whole process in a way that is supportive um, of the person who you're aiming to hire. Once the decision is made to hire, that's when actually the real work begins. Some people think the real work begins by having a coach in place, um, and that's important. Coaching and um, having a support system in place, but very often institutions fail on the support system that's in place. And I would say, I really have a transition team um, made up of more than one person. And that transition team would not only welcome um, the new woman leader to your institution, but would be composed of thought leaders, individuals who have their connections uh, within, within the institution to have the back of the person who you're hiring as um, your leader. And then the institution as a whole needs to stand behind the leader, have a lot of forgiveness when things go off track, and the ability to help that leader be successful. As a profession, I think we have done a horrible job in general of how we support our leaders. We toss them out when something goes wrong. We don't really um, set up a system to help them um, succeed. So I think we have to carry it through um, the full, to the full end of um, not just the appointment, but to the successful performance um, ultimately in that leadership role. Now, having said all of that, I think it is very important that the individual who we want to promote to apply for those kinds of positions be coached and guided about speaking a new language, speaking the language of quantitative argument. So not just making an argument based on the qualitative reasons why a certain strategy should be put in place, but quantitatively. Why is this a good business decision? What is the profit ratio? What is the margin on this decision making? What kind of investments are we going to do? Sometimes in order to speak that language, people will need a really in-depth uh, background in business and um, financial analysis, but that doesn't mean you have to have an MBA. It means you need to be intentional about how you prepare for those kinds of roles. Um, likewise, I think um, the community, meaning all of us together, need to decide um, what do we value most and how are we going to hear the messages um, that come from the leader? And are we open-minded and giving people the benefit of the doubt or are we harsh and critical and ready to move on to the next leader as soon as some mistake is made? And I think those, those, uh, that framework actually applies to um, all genders um, of leadership. So I kind of took your question from women leaders to leadership in general. Wonderful. I, there's a few questions here, and so then I'll come back to you. And and they um, can't hear unless you're speaking. Oh, sorry, sorry, okay. sorry. sorry. Um, so this is an anonymous, and I think this is a really great question based on the kind of scenarios that you gave. Is um, basically there's often in these scenarios that you gave tension between giving immediate feedback um, to the person because there's not anonymity if you you know give the feedback right away. Versus in the typical um, situation, you would wait six months and then aggregate feedback and then say to the, you know, person that this these things happened. Um, so what the person's question is: What are your thoughts about this practice, and what's the best way to address mistreatment in a timely manner? Okay, thank you for that question. It is a really important question, and the first thing I want to say is: Please don't wait six months. I understand why you would. Um, so that you have aggregated data point. But I would say, number one, feedback in the moment or shortly after whatever incident was is extremely important. Number two, most of us, unless we uh, trained in psychology and psychiatry, may not have the skills to be able to do that feedback um, in a way that is comfortable and effective. And so know what you don't know. And when I didn't know how to have a conversation like that, I would call someone who I knew knew it better. Elizabeth Keefe, right here in the audience. Um, 
is someone who I could call and say, hey, Elizabeth, I have this situation. I'm thinking I'm going to say this. And sometimes she'd say, Holly, that's exactly right. But sometimes she'd say, well, Holly, you may want to reframe it this way. Um, or, so anyway, important to give the feedback immediately or as close to the situation as possibly. Don't worry if you feel uncomfortable because we all do. Know how to get help for yourself to give difficult feedback and know who your resources are to draw on to get that help. And then if you find yourself lost, there are two little, two little um, tricks that I've used my whole career when I found myself in that kind of a situation of giving difficult feedback in the moment. The first one was question asking. How do you think this went? What do you think happened uh, with Mrs. Smith on the um, oncology service last week? Every time I asked that question, I learned a whole lot of things I didn't know before that actually added texture and context that was extremely helpful. And the second little trick I used when the person in front of me just was not making sense, and even if they pushed me to the point of clenching my own fists and teeth, like, why did you do that? And, you know, I wanted to say something that I might later regret. I would say to myself, Holly, someone loves this person. Might be their mother, might be their spouse, but somebody loves this person. Control yourself, Holly. Um, you know, there's, um, there's someone in the world who really loves this person who is driving you crazy right now. Now, that is not based in psychology or psychiatry. It's just a little trick that worked for me. <laughs> so if it helps you, I share it in that spirit. Elizabeth, did you want to ask your question? Yes. So great question. So um, the first question is based on my experience in medicine, where if I could choose only one place for an intervention, where would it be? And the second part of the question is um, based on everything I've seen across the country, is there one example that we could all learn from? So uh, I'm gonna answer that question, but I need to preface it by just saying I'm biased based on my experience, but the one place I not only would, but do every single day, focus on with a laser beam is the clinical learning environment. Our training environments that our residents and students are working and learning in could be vastly improved compared to the historical programs that we have in place. So the clinical learning environment. And what is the key, or there are many keys to the clinical learning environment, but among the most important keys are engaging our male colleagues as allies. Our male colleagues were my personal mentors. My male colleagues are the reason I stand before you today. My male colleagues are the direct reason that I had the chance to have a career in medicine. And that's not uniformly the case all across America, but I know that we have men at the University of Chicago who are incredible allies. And the more that we can um, draw from them, from their experience, their wisdom, and their allyship, the more we can make a change in our clinical learning environment. And I, I know you're all doing that actually every single day in the clinical learning environment, but broadly, that's where I'd focus. Um, what have I seen by way of example that we could learn from? 
I'd love to come back and give you a talk on that because um, the Macy Foundation has just launched a Catalyst Award. We've just uh, identified seven institutions for our Catalyst Awards. And um, the Catalyst Award winners who we chose, the seven who we chose all organized themselves spontaneously, not at our direction, but they all organized themselves spontaneously around a theme of creating environments of psychological safety without bias and discrimination in the clinical learning environment. Um, so one of the projects at Duke University is um, to train their leaders and um, residents as civility champions. Um, so anyway, I could go through all of them, but that's probably another talk. I'm just going to um, ask one more talk. There's a couple more, but we can't answer so many. But um, Dr. Lester, um, oh, yes. retired pediatrician, uh, pediatrics faculty, um, basically asking about gender concordance. Um, does the the gender of the leader or the program director affect the you know it, what the gender of the trainee and how you manage the situation? Yes, thank you, Dr. Lester. It's uh, nice to uh, hear from you, even in uh, cyberspace. And I just um, want to share with the whole audience that if you have not read Dr. Lucy Lester's book, I commend it to you. It's a really comprehensive and beautifully written book um, about a long history of women in medicine. So um, thank you for the book and um, thank you for the question about concordance, gender concordance. Um, gender concordance is important for women and it's important for those who come from historically underrepresented groups in medicine, but it's not the whole story. Meaning if you do not have gender concordance, um, if you do not have racial concordance, that doesn't mean you should back away um, from the opportunity to mentor, guide, and lead. So when you have it, it can be helpful. It can also be harmful um, when you have it. Um, and so I would focus quite particularly on the skills and investment of the guide and mentor, irrespective of their gender. Well, let's just give one last thank you to Dr. Humphrey. Next, next week, we're going to be joined by Dr. Lainey Ross, who, um, as you know, was one of our pediatric faculty, has moved to Buffalo, but will be joining us back in person, back in P117, um, talking about um, gender equity in publishing um, and editorships and things like that. So excited to, um, to continue this amazing lecture series. Um, so we will go ahead and um, close this part of it and then ask the ethics fellows to come down to the front to continue this more personal discussion with Dr. Humphrey. So see you next week. <laughs> Wait, where is the mouse for this? Um, I just have to scream. It's like a text screen. Oh, that was great. That was wonderful.